Then, of course, we have to deal with this. Um, more than 8 million people now have seen this TED Talk, and many, many organizations are using it as justification for furthering the livestock industry at the detriment of our planet. Grass-fed meat, even though it doesn't uh, outnumber uh, feedlot or factory farm meat, it's, it's grown grass-fed meat happens to be rising very quickly with sales doubling every year since 2006, obviously by promoting misinformation. Since we don't have another two or three hours to expound on this topic, I can offer you these sources to bolster your understanding about this argument. I've covered this pretty well in my second book. There are the pages in the chapter, and this is one idea that's not worth spreading. Well, Alan Savory's methods though have been proven not to work. But it's, it's what 99% of the global population, 98 to 99% of the global population want to hear. And the line of argument is becoming the latest buzz. He calls it holistic, Alan Savory calls it holistic management. But it's essentially another term for grass fed or pasture livestock systems, just like all the other ones you see on this list. All of which, which equate to continued loss of natural resources, suboptimal human health, and unnecessary slaughtering when any animal is entered into the equation. Founded in 2014 and based off of a best-selling book, Paul Hawken, who's a renowned author and environmental activist, developed a wide-ranging, well-funded, and influential project called Drawdown, but Project Drawdown. But its focus is entirely on climate change. So, so even though their objective is to regenerate our depleted environment, the results of all, all their efforts will be very limited in scope. Remember, it's not, it's not all related to climate change. Also, they broadly advocate, broadly advocate grass-fed livestock as the centerpiece of the future of food production. And the movement called regenerative agriculture essentially repeats what all the rest of these methods are saying based on Alan Savory's holistic management concepts that we need to eat animals, that hooved animals such as domesticated cows are necessary for humans to survive because there's no other way for healthy soil and production of food for us to coexist. Well, so on its surface, regenerative agriculture sounds as if it's the one stop solution to all of our environmental food choice issues stating this in all their all their uh, responsibility statements. It's about farming in a style that nourishes people in the earth with, princip with principles meant to restore soil and ecosystem health, address inequity, and leave our land, waters, and climate in better shape for future generations. However, proponents of this rapidly growing movement are not telling you uh, a number of things that a number of unbiased and respected researchers point to the fact that these livestock driven techniques create a higher carbon footprint than factory farm methods. And then they hide the fact behind other objectives that are used routinely anyway in fully organic plant-based systems, such as use of cover crops, no-till farming, rotational plantings, composting, all used in plant-based systems anyway. The primary argument that regenerative agriculture is needed to combat climate change is nonsensical because one acre of land that's reforested uh, after kicking the livestock off, will sequester up to 100 times more carbon dioxide from our atmosphere than if livestock were left grazing on it in a, man in a managed regenerative agriculture manner. Even a recent Harvard study, very conservative Harvard study, revealed that co converting all cattle operations in the United States to managed grass-fed systems like regenerative agriculture would conservatively require 30% more cattle than what we have already today. And it would create a 43% increase in methane emissions than, than what feedlot raised cows are producing, which of course defies all logic and all what we're trying to accomplish with land use efficiencies and methane reduction. Just for a visual, here's a photo of pigs that are raised by grazing on a registered regenerative agriculture farm. Notice the flourishing brilliant green pasture and healthy grassland and, and soil that's, that won't erode with the first rainfall. <laughs> Amazing. Well, this is one of the many panels I've been involved with uh, over the years uh, with regarding this topic, uh, uh, this regenerative agriculture topic at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, whereby all the participants were arguing that ruminants such as cows and their hooves are necessary, again, for grasslands to exist 
And it's the only way to remedy dust certified areas, those areas that are completely devoid of, of uh, plants. Um, and that we'll all perish if these systems aren't in place. Well, it's too bad that these scientists and livestock advocates are overlooking the fact that there are many, many examples in, 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 of areas in the world that have been completely ravaged by livestock, areas that have been deforested, topsoil loss because of grazing livestock. And now these areas are flourishing with wildlife and plants without the influence of any cattle or hooved animals. The theory that livestock are necessary for rebuilding soil and for our existence is, is completely erroneous for all the reasons that I've just mentioned. But if you need specific examples, I've got them. One perfect example of this is with this guy. In 1980, Ernst Gutsch moved from Germany to a, an area of destroyed rainforest of a little over a thousand acres in Brazil called the dry wasteland by the local tribes. This land was ruined because it was originally ancient tropical rainforest, all cut down like most areas in the rainforest, uh, and then allowed pigs and cattle to be raised on it, crops to feed them. Then erosion occurred, all the topsoil was lost, nothing really could grow on it. It became a desert, it became a dry wasteland. Ernst began his form of agroforestry by planting seeds of indigenous crops, such as bananas and cocoa. And within 25 to 30 years, the rainforest had been rebuilt. It, it came back looking like, looking like this. Notice you don't see any livestock. There are none, none needed. Of course they weren't needed. 17 streams and rivers returned. The climate cooled with recycling of rainwater. Species of animals and plants returned. And again, this was accomplished without cattle. Proving that this reforestation rebuilding of topsoil can be done in other climates, uh, other than tropical rainforest, here's another perfect example of an area that had more than 90% of the topsoil lost. And most of the plants and animals were either exterminated or displaced. A decision was made to simply put this land to rest. No livestock, it wasn't touched. Just allowed to heal on its own and a remarkable evolution began immediately when livestock and conventional row crop farming were removed. And this amazing transformation continued over the next 36 to now 43 years on this farm. Uh, natural pasture and woodlands return, species of insects, birds and other animals reappeared. Pollinators became plentiful where they were non-existent. This is the way it looks today. It's an amazing story of regeneration without the need for livestock. And oh, by the way, I had the have the opportunity to, to verify all this as being quite accurate and follow this story along uh, quite carefully every day since 1979, because this is our property. This is our rescue and sanctuary back in Michigan. It's where my lovely wife, Joe, and I live. So I know it's true. In summary fashion, meat that's produced from grass-fed, pastured grazing, li grazing livestock stock systems, regardless of what you wanna call it or whatever it's called, is actually less sustainable than conventional grain-fed factory farm meat, which of course is less sustainable, much less sustainable than plants for us to eat directly. As we run out of land and water, this metric will become quite important. How much feed does it take to produce one pound of meat? The feed conversion ratio. It can be 70 to one for grazing systems. 70 pounds of feed to go in to get one pound of whatever you wanna call it on the way out. And please pay particular attention to the ratio for plant-based foods at the bottom of the slide, very important. For plants, the ratio varies, but I just picked broccoli. Uh, broccoli as an, as an example, look at, the, look at the complete difference. One pound of seed, instead of putting massive feed in and getting nothing out, one pound of seed yields 16,000 pounds of food. Can anyone see the obvious implications for putting an end to world hunger here? Well, my statement that grass-fed livestock use more water than grain-fed has caused more arguments from prominent scientists in the room than almost any other. But it's a fact, and here's the data, which takes into account all sources of water, green, blue, gray. Take a look for yourself. I just circled it. And then, of course, both types of livestock operations, both feedlot, factory farmed, and grass-fed, use 50 to 100 times more water than growing plants for us to eat directly. Mm -hmm.